Okay, so um, welcome. Um, this is the session number four, uh, the first one from the panel of natural sciences. Uh, my name is Marta Konik and my co uh, Maciej Telesiński. Uh, and uh, our first presenter, uh, Rohan Soman, will uh, tell us something about big data and uh, new approach, new ways of using it to monitor infrastructure. Mm. Maybe this is this was destiny that I spoiled your lunch <laughs> by making you wait, and I am the first one after. Ah, what can you do? Anyway, uh, I'm going to I'm here to talk about the monitoring of in infrastructure in the era of big data. Uh, Big data is a term that is very commonly thrown out, thrown around. Everybody knows about it, has a basic understanding of it, but may not know the magnitude and how it can affect your daily life. And I'm going to present just one of the facets on how it will affect you. Uh, uh, I work in the field of structural health monitoring. Uh, basically, it is measuring while the structure is being used. You can monitor the wind turbine the bridge structure, the airplanes, and why we do it? To avoid collapse and threat to life, and to reduce cost of repairs, because especially for bridge engineering or for wind turbines, the specialized equipment required to do the inspection is prohibitively expensive. So if you kind of know when the repair is going to occur, you can book the, uh, let's say, ship in advance and reduce the cost. Uh, we try to measure some sensitive features, maybe vibrations, maybe the loading, and try to determine thresholds for in case something is going wrong. But the thing is the operating parameters are changing so much that you really need to know what you're monitoring in order to draw any significant conclusions from it. Uh, we, the, met, the damage metrics that we see need to be sensitive to damage, of course. It should be low cost and robust in operating conditions. Take, for instance, the wind turbine. It has Temperature range from around minus 25 to plus 40. Uh, it is expected to work in salinity in extreme winds. So the equipment just has to survive in order to work. Otherwise, there will be false alarms. So in layman's terms, what are we looking for? First, we'll try to find if there is damage, determining the presence of damage. It has been uh, divided into five levels, the whole information. Uh, right now, the state of the art is probably at level two. Level three, some claim to do it, but level four is actually what the owners are interested in, and it's like the holy grail of structural health monitoring. Uh, so level two is like locating the damage to know where the damage is exactly. Uh, level three is determining the extent of damage, and what the bridge owners or the infrastructure owners are is, can I still run it or I, do I need to stop it? So they are interested in the available service life of the things. And it is always handy to determine why the damage occurred in order to avoid further occurrences. So this is like the steps of damage uh, detection uh, methodology. And uh, just things to take away from this is level four is the holy grail. And this is where we want to head. Uh, traditional practices are visual inspection and tap tests. Tap test, visual inspection is we observe the material and see if there is any crack or things like this. Tap test is shown over here. We actually use it quite often to check the integrity of a glass. If we are buying glasses, we just strike them together and if we hear a crack, there is a crack, you will distinctly uh, hear it. Uh, they are not very accurate, but why do we use it? Money. They are cheap and they are very simple. And there is no rules or regulations defining. What is the problem? It's dangerous for the uh, person who is doing the inspection. Uh, imagine being in a windy conditions on the wind tower or wind turbine. And it's very highly subjective to the operator. I have actually a very interesting story about the subjective to uh, the operator. This guy is the father of engineering in India. The engineer's day is celebrated on 15th of September in India thank, uh, on his birthday. And what was his achievement? He is, by the way, uh, Sir Vishweshwaraya. He was given the knighthood by the queen for his services to engineering in India. Uh, once he was traveling on a train, and the, when the train was passing over a bridge, 
he heard some anomaly or the sound of the vibration of the train was off. So he wrote a letter to the bridge company that something is wrong with this bridge. They were not very convinced about the letter, but just to, out of thoroughness, they went and checked and it appeared that it was really wrong. We have been traveling in trains all our life. Have we ever noticed if something was wrong? No. He was a genius. He, is, he was later given the knighthood as well as the most uh, uh, highest of civilian honors of uh, free India. So he's quite special. And that's why Engineer's Day is named after him and not after me, because that's the difference in how it's subjected to the operator. Uh, and it cannot detect internal damage, of course, uh, because we can only see what is there from the outside. Uh, these are the techniques of health monitoring that are uh, used in day-to-day. -day. Rail track monitoring is quite common. Uh, X-ray monitoring, heart rate, smart devices that check your pulse, and earthquake monitoring. If you see that out of the five examples that I have given, three of them are from medical sciences. Why? Because there is money involved there. You tell somebody that you are going to die and he is willing to give you 100 million to develop a product that stops him from dying. You say that 100 people might die and he won't care about them. So there is money that is the prime motivator for funding such research. Uh, this is the overview. Actually, there are a lot of technical terms and things like this. I have not even bothered to explain what some of them is. Uh, what is the highlight is there is no one golden pill for everything. If you look, I have highlighted what uh, different parameters or different requirements are fulfilled by the different methods. And there is no one method that fulfills all of them. So basically, what you can take out from this slide is that we need to we might need to combine one or two of those methods two or more of these methods or go for data fusion in order to achieve uh, what we are seeking uh, but now the world has changed thanks to the last 10 years internet of things big data artificial intelligence uh, it is possible the to change the way we are looking at damage detection and structural health monitoring this is just some Plot that uh, fig figure that I found on the web, on the internet, uh, that shows how much data each of us is producing, and it's humongous. Uh, everything that you do produces some data which can be used by somebody in order to make your life better or worse. So, but there is like approximately three gigabytes of data is generated by each person in a day. That's what the statistics say, but maybe it will increase in the near future. Mm. So we can use this big data for structural health monitoring. For instance, when you're going to buy car, the car can hopefully in the future can detect what's going wrong. You can use the car to detect the bridge, problems with the bridge, for instance. These are one of the strategies that are being considered in the, in the future. Uh, in terms of big data, uh, you can use network level monitoring. For instance, the current problem with structural health monitoring, as I said, was uh, people are not willing to fund research because there is not no money involved. But and it is quite expensive, to be honest. But if you divide the cost to persons, like the car that you have, it has got suspension, it has got a lot of vibration sensors. You can use the, those vibration data, upload it to a cloud, and then d dig into the data in order to find what is common or what is uncommon or what is wrong. This has been practiced on trains because people have more control on trains and uh, trains are more standardized than normal uh, automobiles are and it has shown really good results. Basically all the trains have got some accelerometers on it, they track data and position and they send out data to a cloud which uh, uses artificial intelligence and uh, artificial neural networks to train itself and for anomaly detection. Also, as I mentioned, one method in the previous slide, that one method is not suitable for damage detection in under all circumstances. So we can go for data fusion. We can fuse data from different sources. For instance, a uh, wind turbine, there is a uh, sensor for measuring the wind speed. There is a sensor for measuring how uh, the frequency of rotations. There is a sensor for checking the oil temperature, for instance. You can combine all this data to uh, for compensation of the changing ambient conditions, for instance, to make our uh, uh, structural health monitoring methods 
better or more precise and sensitive. So this is one way which we believe that we can go ahead. And this is something that we are working on in our team right now. The other ways of doing it is through digital twinning. Uh, digital twinning nowadays is quite commonplace in manufacturing units. Uh, according to a PricewaterhouseCoopers report, approximately $30 billion of savings are possible through digital twinning in structures. Uh, the digital twinning is expected to make its debut at such in 2025, where NASA is developing a digital twin of its own space shuttle. Uh, own space shuttle, which basically what the digital twin does is there is an actual uh, physical self and there is a virtual self of the same structure. And whatever you do on the physical structure is mimicked on the artificial structure. And then you can subject the artificial structure to something that is expected in real life and see how the real structure, or predict how the real structure will work. And by this we can often overcome any unforeseen circumstances and reduce the costs of the structure, of replacement, of maintenance, so on and so forth. And a thing is, that is controversial is feature data mining. There is vast amounts of data, as I, I showed you on the slide. You can put uh, artificial intelligence based or artificial neural network to train itself in order to detect anomalies and then use it for structural health monitoring. There is, the controversy is, of course, uh, you might have uh, been aware of the personal data protection update that we got on the 26th of, no, 24th of this month. This might get tricky on sharing of data, and that's why it is uh, controversial on how to use it and how to mine it. But this is somewhere that we might be going in the future. This is some of the work that we did. As I said, one method was not <coughs> suitable for detecting all kinds of damage. So we tried to use more than one technique. Uh, terahertz technique, everybody would be uh, aware of this because it's commonplace at the airports now. You, where you go into a probe, you stand up with your hands up and it scans you. Uh, something similar on a smaller level is possible. And I think infrared thermography is going to be super commonplace. There are some nice videos actually, but unfortunately they're not working. But uh, infrared thermography is going to be a commonplace. Your plumber is going to be using it in the next year or so. Now there are devices that you can plug into your iPhone and the software app designated for this for infrared thermography to detect leaks in your pipes which are inside your walls. And it is going to be super commonplace. Uh, and there are devices already for like $400 that you can uh, just attach to your iPhone and use it. And this is the way that uh, it's going to, it's extremely safe and uh, it can be used in common practice. Okay, this, I don't uh, want to go into the details again. I know there are a bunch of symbols. I'm not going to explain them. I tried to delete this slide, really, I tried. <laughs> but this is what I did for my PhD and it is too close to my heart to remove it. Sorry about it, just wanted to show off a little, but sorry, I could just couldn't delete it. <laughs> this is the method that I developed. Basically, the concept is really simple. You have a beam, you bend it. One side experiences positive strain or expansion, the other is contraction. There will be some pl place in the middle which will be experiencing zero. This is the neutral axis point. This is only, it is not dependent on the force that you apply, it's only dependent on the condition of the structure. So if there is damage, this will move, and if you check how much it has moved, you can detect that there is damage. The concept is very simple. You use some fancy math over there, but sorry, I couldn't just uh, delete it. it. Skip over it. Uh, again, some nice, uh, uh, animations that we did. The, actually, it would have been nice to have those videos working because uh, it's quite obvious that, uh, oh, they're working, nice. Even to a naked eye, we can find that the, one of the waves is propagating faster than the other. This is the effect of moisture in the composite. This is possible in the naked eye because both the beams, or the same beam in two orientations were exactly matched. But if you train a computer to do it, it will do it every time in a more precise and under varying condition. So this, uh, this is the way we are going ahead, image processing by computers. This is some of our future work in terms of the data fusion techniques. These are the four different methods and how there is synergy, to, so we optimize the use of resources. The same sensors are used for two methods or the data from one is used to uh, 
combine the temperature compensation or different levels of fusion in order to extract more. So optimization is one of the key factors to reduce the cost of our equipment. Uh, the future in what you can take away from here, there is big money here. The, sorry, there is big money over here. The, it is expected to grow at 8% annually. So there is a big scope. Uh, use of autonomous devices like the drones is going to increase. Even for underwater inspections, it is being used already. Uh, Self-healing and self-maintaining structures, that is going to be uh, for the future. NASA is already developing something for the uh, mission on Mars, where they will be self-healing and self-maintaining structures. Uh, and uh, sustainable power management, uh, energy harvesting, battery technology. These are the places where we are still lacking, and this is something that we should be work, work will be done on. The biggest pitfalls. Where this vision might not happen if pal passive policy makers and industrial inertia. There are no standards set for the use of artificial intelligence in structures and how inspections can be done or structural health monitoring can be done. There is no standardization there. So there is a need for doing it. And we have been using structures for more than 2,000 years since uh, life as we know it. But uh, monitoring is relatively new. So there is something, insurance company risk management policy. The reason why AI is not, or artificial intelligence cars are not yet is because insurance companies don't know whom to blame. That is the big problem and they control a lot of money and that is the thing. Uh, lack of performance data, as I said, we have been using SHM for only 10 years. Ethical concerns on AI, they might overpower men or humans in general. And as I said, you can, there is a lot of data and you can leave an artificial neural network and AI to train itself and find some significant parameters, but correlation is not causation. You have to take it with a pinch of salt, whatever the big data gives, throws up. And in the end, I would like to drop off with uh, this. With great data comes great responsibility and of course heat, because every data corresponds to some heat generation and in the area of climate change, we need to be responsible on how to do it, get rid of it. I'd like to thank the sponsors and my co-workers. And if any questions. OK, thank you, Rohan, for your interesting presentation. Do we have any questions? OK, so maybe I will have uh, one short question. Uh, how much, uh, how big computational power do you need? Uh, does it take long to uh, do this analysis? For now, no, because still we are working on raw data. But uh, if we start working on digital images, then it will take a long time. Uh, and it will be computationally intensive to work for. Uh, the funny story, funny side of things is uh, the budget for computational studies for research is relatively low. If we get Hollywood in charge in it, we can achieve it much quicker. Thank you. And when do you think our cars will be collecting data on, on uh, <laughs> bridges? Uh, pretty soon, actually. <laughs> and in 10 years, 15 years time, for sure. Thank you very much. So now we welcome the next speaker. <laughs> Kaliswaran Balas Brahmanian. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, that's fine spelled your name, uh, who will talk about various health measurement techniques in structural engineering. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, people in Europe, they usually call me as Kalesh, so just if you want, you can stick to that name. Uh, I'm from the Institute of uh, Fluid Flow Missionary, uh, Polish Academy of Sciences, where we work on various uh, techniques to understand the uh, structure. The health denotes it just similar to our health when we see structure as health. If like the loss of its structure or it get detroited or corrosion, everything leads to its health. That's why it's uh, health, we call it as health here. So let's move on. Okay, this is a synopsis for the uh, presentation when which I'm gonna talk about how we assess this, various types of methodology that we have in this assessment, like the NDT methods, what are the NDT methods available? What are the structural health measurement uh, monitoring methods available? how we use the guided waves, the waves that in general in this analysis, and our work followed by the acknowledgement. So why this assessment is needed? 
because safety and comfortability of the uh, passengers, and I'm talking about the aerospace industry here, when we get more money, okay, is of utmost important as the number of passengers and the number of routes of the aircraft, the aerospace industry grows. This directly relates to the uh, use of the aircraft, of course. As in, the as in this case, the aging of the aircraft increases. So to get the airworthiness, one has to perform all these techniques. Nowadays, people fly in Viz Air or Ryanair for a cheap cost, but if it gets damaged, uh, the aircraft industry is booming. So you have to analyze these techniques time to time so as to get the airworthiness that we get. So as I mentioned here, the aerospace industry is very large, when which annually 4 billion people, they travel, and it generates around $6.5 trillion. So it's a booming industry. So uh, the engineer, the uh, aircraft maintenance engineer, should analyze these uh, techniques, like they have to analyze the disintegration, the cracks, the bending, the delamination in the material, and to get rid of it to get the airworthiness certification. So this is very important. So various techniques available. First, let me talk about some old techniques. Uh, first of all is NDT, when which uh, it's a, the synonym of it is non-destructive testing, when which you can analyze a material or assembly or a component without destroying it. Okay, that is the basic technique. You can evaluate the material, you can analyze it and get the assumption, okay, it's just assumption of where the errors are. So it is very easy to use. You don't need any uh, kind of uh, uh, high education to do this, it is very simple. It saves costs, it is very less time consuming, and it is somewhat reliable, and it is safety as well. So various NDT methods are available, but I'm just gonna uh, talk about some important methods like the visual inspection, how we see uh, the errors, eddy current method, acoustic testing method, uh, thermography method, and the uh, fiber optic sensing method. So let's move on to the visual inspection. Uh, this is the, the normal principle that we see, that we hear, or that we sense. So that is the visual inspection. So why it is needed? Uh, to understand where the uh, foreign objects are, that is uh, the FO, FOD that we call, or to see where the damages in the material or the components, or to find where the cracks are, it's just a visually. As I said, uh, it is like with the help of this video inspection, or with the help of mirrors, or the help of glass, or the help of agroscope, these are equipment that you need just to visually see where the errors are. It is very simple, it is cost effective, you can easily portable, you can usually just carry a mirror or a, a video kind of thing and just check where the errors are and you just record a minimum training. But the cons is that uh, it is unreliable, you cannot rely on this and it is highly Im it is highly imprecisable and it, it creates lots of misinterpreted data. Early in the, uh, there is one aircraft investigation study of the 1970s, when which uh, engineer just approved uh, aircraft of 1930 uh, uh, with the help of just visual inspection, but it resulted in the crash of the aircraft, and it is and this paved way for various further studies in the future uh, air crash investigation and in the aircraft industry. Uh, let's move on to the next one method, that is the eddy current method. As the name suggests, it, it generates eddies in the material so the principle is just a simple one. It works on the principle of electromagnetic induction. But what is electromagnetic induction? It is a principle when which an alternating current is passed on to a conductor that is a material in this case, and it generates a magnetic field. So the, there is there will be a probe which analyzes the magnetic field to and fro. From the material, if there is no flaws, it just gives in the time difference between the material, between this uh, uh, magnetic field that is generated but if there is any flaw, it creates a disinterrupter. That is like that is like interruption in the magnetic field that is generated. So based on the interruption and without interruption, one can analyze if there is a crack or not. Mainly, it is uh, helpful in identifying the cracks, material losses, and material thickness is very important because uh, in the automotive industry, where which in the floor pan, you should have a similar thickness. If it is of dissimilar thickness, you can get a lot of uh, problems in the uh, distribution of material, material properties. So that is very essential to understand the thickness of material as well. It has cons, that is like there will be a lot of uh, loss of uh, the magnetic flux, and there will be heat loss during this process as well. 
Uh, let's move on to the next method, that is ultrasonic inspection method, where in which we use ultrasonic waves to understand where the cracks are or where the damage is done. So this works on the principle where in which we send in the ultrasonic signals into a material and we uh, uh, get back the waves and just analyze where the defects are based on the time difference and based on the electrical signals that is generated. We work, uh, we use this technique in metals, ceramics, plastics, composites, as well as in uh, metal industry. Let me uh, give a small animation about how this inspection works. This is a uh, material with a small uh, flaw here. With a small flaw here. And there will be a probe with the exciter. This sends in the ultrasonic signals. So it just, this similar, this uh, uh, process is similar to the sonar that we use it in uh, shipping industry. When which it touches the bottom of the, uh, the boundaries and it deflects back. So that is the time travel, that is the L. But if it detects any flaws, so the time travel is reduced and it, uh, we get back the signal. So based on this, we come to assumption that there is a flaw, there is a uh, interrupted uh, thing in it. And based on this, we understand there is a, a kind of a foreign objects present or foreign uh, cracks in the uh, material. The advantage of this is it's safe to use, anyone can use it, and it can penetrate more to a larger distance. Uh, let's move on to the acoustic uh, emission method, the acoustic uh, testing. The idea in this, when which we use a probe, the exciter, it emits the acoustic. The last one was the ultrasonics. Before that, we saw various things, and in this case, we're gonna use the acoustic uh, waves. It sends in the acoustic waves to a material, and when the material, if there is any change in the load, or if the material is stressed, or the material, there's a change in the temperature, it uh, emits the acoustic signal. So based on the sent signals and the received signals, we analyze the changes in the uh, material properties. And it works on the principle of resonance. What are the factors? As I said, the factors are the same, when which based on the time calculation, like as in the previous method, based on the time we send the signals, we receive the signals, and based on the resonance frequency, we can understand uh, the acoustic. So let me uh, put up a small animation how the entire uh, process works, when which if there is a crack or just a failure, it emits those acoustic signals, which are captured by a transducer, and it is amplified, pre-amplified, and it is filtered to get the healthy data or the damaged data. It just segregates where the defects are, where there are no defects, and it's again amplified, and it's separated by a signal conditioner and stored it in a PC. So based on these results, we can understand where the data are uh, interrupted or where they are not interrupted. So next method is the fiber optic sensing method, widely used nowadays in various kinds of industries, uh, industries like the communication industry, etc. The fiber optic sensor method, the process is uh, simple and straightforward, when which a source emits the light so it, to a sensor, that is a fiber optic sensor. So the light uh, is, uh, the fiber optic sensor analyzes the light and understands where the lights are modulated. The, the light, the source light gets modulated by with the varying in temperature or varying in the pressure or varying in the uh, load. The modulated light is again uh, captured by the sensor and processed by a signal and then stored up in the control system. So this is, this is the advantages of this method. Uh, as I said, it's used in various industries because of this kind of advantages, like it is explosion proof, it is very compact in size, it can secure data, it has good accuracy as well, and it can withstand harsh conditions. That's why we use kind of these kind of uh, sensors in the underground networks as well. And this is just a picture of how the uh, fiber optic uh, sensor uh, looks like. Then which we have the cable, we have the cladding to prevent it from harsh conditions, to prevent it from various temperatures, and the core of it when which it transfers the signals. So let's move on to the radiography and thermography methods. Widely used now, mainly in medical industry radiography, it's just uh, X-rays is a good example of the radiography technique. So the radiography, it works on the principle of radiation, when which the, the X-rays, the radiated waves, are passed down to a material, and the material is coated up with the film, and based on the image that we get, the Latin image, we can understand where the cracks are. This is a, a skull, this is a skeleton one. We can understand where the cracks are. 
Next is the thermography, when which exciter sends in the thermal energy into a composite and it returns back as a thermal image. This we use in nowadays in day-to-day -day activities uh, to get where the thermal signals are, especially in forest fire kind of thing, we analyze where the maximum temperature is and to understand the region to uh, uh, go and help. So let's move on to our main uh, uh, code that we use, uh, structural health monitoring. It differs from NDT in terms of continuous monitoring. That is the main uh, principle here, when which it detects where the damage is, it locates where the damage is, it identifies what the type of damage is, and you can quantify what the severity of the damage. So this is similar uh, to, to our human body. Let's see this uh, picture. This is similar to our human uh, body, like the brain and the spinal cord and the nerve endings. So. So this is a continuous process. If you get a kind of uh, a pinch here, you can understand where the, uh, where the where we get affected. So the structural health monitoring works on a similar principle when which use sensors and to identify where the error, where the failure is happening. So this is a continuous process. The loop is uh, mentioned here when which we use various parameters. We implement a strategy. We observe the structure time to time and we predict the lifetime of a structure based on this loop. So this is, uh, this is also called as NDT, but, is, but it is called in-service NDT, and it is a continuous monitoring NDT method. So, uh, so the, the advantages of it is just, it is cost effective, it is very safe to use, uh, it is maintenance free, and uh, it can uh, damage the structure uh, uh, very easily. A kind of Ishikawa diagram, what are the components that is needed for this uh, structural health monitoring? We need materials, that is a geometric property, and the mechanical property of it. We need sensors so that we can position it on various uh, positions to understand uh, the various errors that we get. We need parameters like the frequency or the, uh, the cycles, the filter window, the voltage, is on technical terms that are used here. And at the end, we get data. From the data, we just uh, separate the data to get what we need or what we don't need. And this results in the final health analysis. So this is a, a bar chart, which first one is with the NDT method and with the SSM method. So the reliability and the total cost is far more higher. Uh, in the uh, NDT method, the reliability is very less, but in SSM method, the reliability is more, which is completely different in the total cost as well. So guided waves are the lamp waves that we use in our uh, lab. We use this, uh, this is an important uh, technique that we use in our lab because they can travel to longer distances with less loss in energy. They can use an in-service inspection as well and it is highly sensitive. So various characteristics that it depends on, it depends on the frequency of the material, the, uh, the thickness of the material, the elastic property, and it works on the principle of pitch catch method and the pulse echo method. So the uh, pitch catch method is just we keep the actuator and we receive those damage signals at the end. So this is the pitch catch method or when which the actuator will be at one end and the receiver will be at the other end. The pulse echo method is just straightforward when which the instrument serves as both the actuator and the receiver. Based on this, we analyze the symmetric wave and the anti-symmetric wave respectively. So our work in our department, we mainly work on the guided waves to understand the structure and to identify the uh, failure of the material. We have developed genetic algorithm methods to position these sensors. So position of the sensor is very important to understand uh, the uh, process. We are currently working on isotropic material like aluminum and with a frequency range of 20 to 300 kilohertz. We use various devices and with the GA code. And this is the positioning of the sensors in a plate to understand the guided waves, the waves that move in. And based on this, we understand where it's getting failed, where it's getting bent. <coughs> Sensor positioning, and we use uh, the actuator, the receiver, just uh, equipment here. So I thank you for your attention. We acknowledge this with uh, uh, help funding from National Science uh, Center for that. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Um, maybe. Uh, um, One minute. Um, at first, I thought that the, uh, with all those methods, there is a, a human person that kind of 
checks whether there is, um, um, I don't know, some mistake or not. But okay, now I, now I understand that you have sen some sensors on the plane. How is, because I didn't understand that, how then the data from the sensors is um, like gathered to some, I don't know, information center? Is it like all the time or only when the plane is at some, only on the um, airport, airport or um, no, no, I don't know? It's all the time. So you, you, these kind of sensors will be there in the fuel uh, the unit or in the near to the rudder where you can control it. So if there is any malfunction in that area, it automatically informs to the pilot. In the early days, we have this control system like the fly-by-wire system, when which you have to see whether it is working or not. We have to pull in the levers to check, but nowadays there are sensors here which automatically check how, how much the amount of fuel are there, or where if there is any that is not working. So this, it's a loop process when which you can get the information time to time, time to time. Thank you. Any more questions? Okay, thank you. You talked about airplanes. Are there any other? Uh, I'm sure there are, but what are the other applications? Um, medical as well. Sorry? Medical industry. Um, in, in automobile industry, you can use, but uh, nowadays people are satisfied with the vehicle that they have, and they want the vehicle to be of less cost. So, okay, so this uh, requires some more money as well, but the people nowadays, they want cheap vehicles to run. They just want the vehicle. But this is different from aerospace industry when which this process is widely used, where the people are ready to spend more money when compared to automotive industry. But the other good industry is medical, as well as the communication industry, the ECE. Yeah. Staying up in the space, uh, the next presenter, uh, Ms. Emilia Profi <laughs> from the University of Warsaw. She will tell us something about dangers that we'll, we can expect in space. Thank you for introduction. Um, when you see a nice sky and people from all the centuries always uh, looked up and see the night sky, the stars, the universe, and always were curious what's more was there. And now we at the time that the space flights, even the long term journeys are possible. And maybe within a few years, some uh, uh, journey to Mars. So let's imagine that we are in the spaceship to Mars. And there, the pathogen occurs on our spaceship. The infection outbreaks. Astronauts have lower immunity. Microbes have higher resistance to antibiotics. So now, every astronaut on the ship is sick and eventually all die. Uh, I wanna um, take a closer look at this um, pretty catastrophic path. And uh, as a model, I will use an international space station when, um, when most of the research are taken uh, right now. And uh, the international space station is uh, orbiting around uh, in altitude around 200 to uh, 550 kilometers above the Earth, and it's called low Earth orbit. So it's even within the Earth atmosphere. And as a reminder, uh, the microorganisms are everywhere, and even the toilet seat isn't as dirty as we think it is. So it's more uh, microbes on telephone, for example. So the international, sp international space station isn't, an, uh, isn't uh, sterile, of course, and I'm talking about the inside of it, because we as human bring on us uh, microorganisms here. So the first step to prevent this catastrophic path and this pathogen occurring is monitoring the space station. And I mean constantly. <coughs> pre-flight, in-flight, and there are some current standards. But what are we looking at right now? Um, I take, for an example, the air, and here we are, the values like 300 CFU per uh, cubic meter. What does it mean? It's CFU, it's colony forming unit, and the colony we are, have here, and uh, we assume that uh, 
one colony is uh, one, but when the one bacteria or fungi uh, started to uh, develop. And during insight, for example, in the air, there are 100 uh, colony forming units per cubic meter. And uh, to compare this with some earth uh, standards, we have, uh, for example, operating room, we have in earth at least, <coughs> at most uh, 100 colony forming units, but in the gym it's 300. So it's uh, little, maybe not little, it's less than in a gym, but of course it's not as clean as in the operating room. And the surfaces and the air and the water are uh, sampled, and but what we get are the bacteria on and fungi on plates. So we can only tell how many of um, microbes are there. Not <coughs> usually not type type of the microbes are there. So even if there there is a pathogen we cannot identify it so well up in the space. I mentioned that uh, astronauts have a lowered immunity system uh, and it is caused by uh, various of the conditions that are there, molecular gravity, radiation, stress, temperature changes, pressure, and I'm just gonna talk shortly about it that it causes uh, a lot of alterations and for example in antibi antibody production or macrophage function. So it led to the question how microorganisms behave in space it's because uh, when astronauts have lower immunity so maybe the pathogen, how the pathogens behave. Uh, <coughs> the changes in microbial features are also caused by the same uh, conditions like microgravity or radiation, but mostly by uh, microgravity, and which is like uh, being in constant uh, fall, and what we uh, usually see is that it's like floating into in the uh, spacecraft. Um, and what is causing to the microbes these conditions? The growth of uh, some microorganisms are increased. Uh, we have here the gray, uh, the green curve that shows the bigger uh, overall population of these uh, bacteria uh, well bred in space. Uh, the type of growth is different. Here, this is the space growth. The bacteria grow in some clusters. Uh, higher resistance to antibiotics, as I mentioned. Um, here we have an example of Escherichia coli, which is actually this uh, strain is not pathogenic, but I'm sorry, but we can see that in space uh, this species could survive even at a concentration of gentamicin, uh, 175 micrograms per uh, milliliter, and in the earth it's 75, so it's pretty high. Uh, the volume, the size of the uh, bacteria cell also changes. And for example, for instance, this is, it's, uh, mm, uh, it's smaller than on the earth. The next one is virulence and pathogenesis. Uh, in some types of microorganisms, also the virulence is higher so when we take, for an example, salmonella, uh, it causes quicker the mice to die, and also the mortality is higher. And even with the uh, lower dose, the mortality is still high. <coughs> uh, there are also other changes uh, that occur for example, different gene expression, biofilm formation, and also increased resistance to other stress conditions. Uh, but uh, we have not much time, so I won't be talking uh, so uh, much about them. But there are also a good microorganisms on us. So what about our microbiome? 
there are not so many comprehensive research on this. Mostly it is about uh, gathering data, how uh, the species change, how their <coughs> amount changes. Uh, for example, I just uh, show you that they collected uh, samples from astronauts' cheeks and before uh, flight the dominant fungi species uh, was uh, alternaria, but after, but during and after uh, the start, it was malassezia, which is the opportunistic pathogen, which means uh, in normal conditions, this fungi doesn't cause uh, some uh, illness, but when the astronauts have uh, immunity system lowered, it may cause some uh, illnesses. And we can see that it gets higher while in flight. Um, these are not the only properties, the features of microorganisms that are researched. Uh, from the first flights, uh, the survival in the space environment, and I don't mean here by this microgravity, but being outside and uh, mm, have to cope with uh, no pressure, with vacuum, with uh, various of radiations. Uh, and here we have facilities from uh, the ISS, which there are some bacteria samples or fungi samples that I exposed to space. Uh, there are mm, many data about it, and mostly it is that uh, this fungi or this bacteria can survive such uh, amount of time outside or can't. Uh, there are some species that can for a uh, few minutes or even a few days survive, but uh, there are non uh, species that could survive like in 100% uh, <coughs> and just for a curiosity this is the uh, probe when the bacteria I uh, bred uh, in space because uh, mm, this probe is prepared on earth because uh, in the space they cannot uh, bred and have contact with bacteria so everything must be prepared on Earth. Then uh, in this space, it's uh, only mixed together, like bacteria inoculum with media, and then conservated to until it's back in the ground. And it's stored in like these contai containers. Um, so I was talking just briefly about researching microorganisms in space. Uh, and how important microbial controlling is and how the space environment affects the microbes. But just a thought that uh, from me as a microbiologist, that even the tiniest organisms can cause uh, the failure, failure to some space uh, journeys when we uh, want to do the science down on Earth properly. interesting. Uh, do you have uh, any questions? Okay, so maybe I'll start just out of curiosity. How do you collect samples? Do you have a cooperation with any space agency? Uh, I'm not into like, like I'm not working on it. It's uh, uh, I just a few months ago I read something more about ISS and I decided to make a presentation about it but I'm not uh, unfortunately not working uh, within cooperation in NASA, with NASA, or <laughs> <laughs> I wish I would have that maybe. And uh, do you know how uh, how do they uh, sterilize the drinking water? Um, because it might be interesting. Do the traditional ways work there? Uh, there might be some UFA, UFA radi radiation uh, or sterilizing uh, with high temperature. But even this with this in this drink drinking water, uh, there might occur some bacteria as they were uh, in these standards that if if they can. Thank you. Do you know what?
what's the mechanism because uh, behind the uh, higher resistance of pathogens to antibiotics? Uh, it's interesting because uh, it's not n fully known. There are some hypotheses, uh, and the interesting is that not all bacteria or fungi are changed. And uh, it is proposed that it's due to the uh, mobility of some, for example, bacteria when they uh, can move, they ha when they, where they are more motile, so uh, they are not changed, but where they cannot move by themselves, uh, they grow and resistance is changed. There are some changes in the, uh, in the wall or in the size, and mostly they are not uh, genetic, so it's like the environment some kind causes the... So mostly the lack of gravity. Yes, yes. But the molecular bases are, are not known yet. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you, and uh, we've come to the end of this session. Um, so uh, have a, co a short coffee break, and uh, thank you. And uh, we will start in 15 minutes. And don't forget to look at the posters during the coffee break.